Hi, I'm Annie Leonard with the story of stuff. Welcome to another episode of The Good Stuff, where we talk with people who are working on solutions to the take-make-waste system that's trashing the planet, threatening our communities, and harming our health. Not long ago, there was a popular bumper sticker that perfectly captured our society's obsession with stuff. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. A lot of people have bought into that notion, spending their entire lives acquiring the latest gadgets, shiny cars, big houses. But today, more and more people are seeing that happiness comes not through owning things, but through having access to the things that foster rich experiences with their friends, family, and community. They're choosing to be part of the trend towards collaborative consumption, or as our grandparents would have called it, sharing. They're sharing power tools, lawnmowers, bikes, and cars. When they travel, they're staying in people's homes instead of hotels. They're joining online communities that help them give things away that they don't use anymore to someone who will use it. The sharing economy is booming, and there's a lot of excitement about how it holds the promise of revolutionizing our relationship with stuff and with each other. But as in any revolution, the transition also brings challenges. What about the taxi drivers who may lose their livelihoods if people use ride-sharing services instead of cabs? What about the laws that promote and protect private ownership and pose legal barriers to sharing? What about corporations looking for ways to turn sharing into profit without giving back to the community? In part two of our series on the sharing economy, we'll talk to an expert on these issues. She's got tons of practical advice to help you get started with sharing and an inspiring vision for sharing as a vehicle for social change. Ready? Let's go. My guest today admits that she might not be the first person you think of when you think of sharing. She's a lawyer, but her practice is focused on helping people and organizations share resources and create more sustainable communities. She works with social enterprises, nonprofits, cooperatives, community gardeners, co-housing communities, and others working to change the world. The American Bar Association has recognized her as a legal rebel who is remaking the legal profession through the power of innovation. She's the co-author of a fantastic book called The Sharing Solution and co-founder of the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Please welcome to The Good Stuff, Janelle Orsi. Thanks so much for coming in today, Janelle. Oh, thank you so much, Annie. It's really great to be here. Do you come to this from a different perspective than a lot of the other people that I work with on sharing? Is that I originally got interested in sharing for the environmental benefits. Is can we decrease the amount of resources that we use through sharing what we have instead of each having our own? But you come to sharing much more through a social justice perspective. When I lived in Pomona, California, which is one of the lowest income, highest violence cities in L.A. County, I all I really thought about in all of my work was just, I was just paying attention to youth and just recognizing how hard their lives were at every level. You know, there was interaction with juvenile justice system, there's immigration issues, there's lack of health care, lack of access to education. And I just thought I need to become a lawyer so I, that I can make their lives better better and give them more opportunities and, and fight for their rights. And so I went to law school in Berkeley, and most of what I focused on was juvenile justice as in law school. Uh, but at the same time, I was living in uh, what we called casual co-housing in Berkeley. And that meant that um, there's four neighboring households, and we shared a lot of things. We shared vacuum cleaner. We shared garden space. We shared meals. We shared laundry. Uh, my housemates shared a pickup truck with other friends. And so sharing kind of planted itself in my mind while I was doing all this work on juvenile justice. And at some point, I realized, you know, sharing is such a powerful thing because if you're if you live in a low income community and you really you're working hard all of your life to try to fulfill this American dream, a lot of people just don't get anywhere. And a lot of it's just because they can't. Um, because of the way that society is set up. But sharing really takes the resources we have, even if those resources are limited, and it just helps those resources have more power and more power to meet our needs. And so then I decided, well, I will actually become a lawyer to help people share things and to help people share housing and share cars and form community gardens to feed themselves and form worker co-ops to provide livelihoods. And then off I went. What happens when people share is usually they're making agreements with each other and they're forming organizations. They're basically getting organized. And a lot of what lawyers do is grease the wheels of people's 
transactions and their relationships, and they they help people make agreements, and then they help people understand what regulations come up when you engage in activities together. A couple years into it, I realized, well, our entire legal system is really designed around not sharing. It's designed around taking and extracting as much as you can. And um, so I co-founded the Sustainable Economies Law Center to really um, take a deeper look at those legal issues and to advocate for policies that, that facilitate sharing. I would say the most common client or type of client that I work with is people who are forming shared housing arrangements. And, you know, since the 50s, everyone's dream was to buy a house and own it all by yourself. And most people, I think, are looking at that and just seeing such a hurdle uh, to accomplishing that, uh, that they're sort of looking for alternatives and they don't want to just be renters. So people come together, uh, they buy single family homes together, they purchase duplexes together, or they buy uh, pieces of land where they're going to form something like a co-housing community or an eco-village. And there's a lot of agreements to navigate. There's a lot of real estate issues. and um, But a lot of what, some of what I work on is legal questions. A lot of what I work on is just helping people navigate the logistics. A lot of it is just thinking about the eventualities, like what happens if this happens? How are we going to respond? That's a big step is to share housing. What if someone wants to start sharing but is not quite ready to buy a house with someone yet? What are some other things people are sharing? Oh, well, sharing stuff. That's sort of the maybe the gateway drug to sharing is I live in an apartment building now and um, my neighbor and I share a vacuum cleaner. It's technically my partner's vacuum cleaner, but it lives at my neighbor's house and I send her a text message whenever I want to borrow it. It's so easy and it takes up much less space in my apartment because it's not in my apartment. And I think all of us just think, well, this was a great idea. And, um, you know, little things like that. But you can, once you start to get comfortable with people and comfortable with communicating and arranging, sharing, you can start to take bigger steps and maybe consider sharing a car or, uh, or you know, doing just filling your world with more casual sharing, like having more shared meals with people and sharing the vegetables from your garden. And the more you do it, I think the more you want to do it. What do you think is that that cultural hesitancy or what's in the way of getting comfortable to share? Yeah. I just think that we've all grown up with the expectation that success means that we've that we meet all of our needs all by ourselves and that we've become really independent. And I found that it's much easier to give things to other people and to do things for other people than it is to ask other people to help you. It feels kind of embarrassing to ask for help sometimes. And um, I think that the more we create a culture of sharing in society, that feeling will dissipate. But I think we just all need to start taking that step. For a while, my car was dying every morning because something was draining the battery. And then I started asking various neighbors every morning to jumpstart my car. And I think that it actually made them so happy to do something for somebody else. And it really, that's the sort of spark that began to build relationships with my neighbors. I really think you put your finger on it with um, saying that we've been so raised to think that we should all be self-reliant and independent. And if we associate um, asking for help or admitting that we need each other in any way, if we associate that with weakness, that's a huge problem because as our economy continues to stumble along, as our environment continues to deteriorate, we're going to need each other in the future even more than we do today. So if sharing is a way to get us to start admitting and even embracing that we need each other, that's incredibly powerful. How fortuitous is that, that the very thing we need to do to build thriving, fulfilling communities and to figure out how to live sustainably on this planet, that very thing is fun. Mm -hmm. It adds friends and happiness yeah. to our lives. So it's not about, you know, come over here and be a self-righteous eco-martyr and insist on sharing and refuse to buy anything. It's about come over here and let's share our stuff and lighten our loads and have way more fun mm -hmm. in the process. Yeah. So in addition to this sort of cultural obstacle that we're already seeing beginning to shift, what are some of the legal obstacles in the way of sharing or sort of legal red flags people should be aware of as we figure out how to share more? As people start sharing in ways that get more organized, like they're forming tool lending libraries or they're forming food cooperatives, then there's a lot of questions, legal questions about, well, should that be a nonprofit or should it be a cooperative? And what type of insurance should we get? And what types of regulations might we need to uh, comply with? And sometimes uh, there, are, there are proven models out there that people can work with, but there's also a lot of laws that we'll need to change to just make this a lot easier. I actually came up with a list of 20 questions to discuss when you share things. I put it in my book, The Sharing Solution. 
Why is it that sharing is having such a resurgence right now? What's happening now is people are taking sharing to a new level, and that's why I think we're coming up with a lot of new phrases for it, just to call attention to the fact that this is kind of new. We are taking it to new levels. And nonprofits, I think, are realizing that sharing could help them serve their missions, their social and environmental missions, even better. And and governments are thinking, well, sharing could actually help us meet the needs of our citizens even more efficiently. And businesses are looking at sharing and saying, wow, there's just this surge of interest in sharing. We could make money if we build the tools and the platforms that help people share. There are these huge companies that are forming around sharing and providing tools to help people share their cars or or like Airbnb is a platform that helps people host guests in their home for money. and. I think that what we should all be heading toward as a society is building tools and platforms that we as communities control because it's for our benefit, it's for the purpose of providing for ourselves. And so if we are putting money into these things, I think we as a community should be benefiting from any profits that are generated. And we as a community should control those platforms because it, at the end of the day, it's really for us as a community. So do you think these sharing platforms should be publicly owned? I think that publicly owned could be great because that's that's sort of one – that's our society's way of managing common resources. But there are other ways that communities can kind of create their own – commons in a way, like we could form cooperatives that we manage for our benefit. And the, the great thing about cooperatives is that there's sort of two things. One is that they're democratic and they're managed on a one member, one vote basis. So everybody has a voice. And that's great because these are platforms that are designed to meet the needs of everybody. And then the other thing about cooperatives is that the profits get distributed back to the people who use it on the basis of how much they use it. And so it's, it's a very equitable system that's not building sort of profit motives into sharing. Like, I think the motivation to share should be to share and to provide for people, not to generate profits. What are some of the other pitfalls that we need to think about as we talk about how to share, how to increase sharing throughout the economy? One of the things that I'm thinking of is about the labor displacement issue. Um, I get a lot of people asking me, of what will happen to the workers who make all the power drills if families start sharing power drills or the workers at the big box store who sell all the stuff? If we stop buying so much stuff, what happens to the workers who make and sell all that stuff? I think that the workers in society are going to just have much better jobs in the end because sharing is going to create jobs. It's going to create jobs for people who run the tool lending libraries and who uh, work behind the scenes at a food co-op. And it's going to create jobs for people who administer cooperatives and, and handle the logistical stuff. And it, what it does is it creates you know, millions of these jobs at the local level rather than having huge centralized companies manage these jobs and provide them for us. And I think that when we begin to localize the organizations for sharing and um, and as people are developing to them together, I think it's going to create much more rewarding jobs because people will have control and a lot more voice in what their jobs look like. Yeah. Sharing is going to disrupt some of the business as usual, but business as usual needs to be disrupted. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not it's not working well, so it could use some disruption. But I just want to make sure that as we do that, we're thinking about the the workers and the um, everybody. Actually, we should be thinking about everybody in our economy and make sure that this transition to a more sharing based economy rather than a consumption based economy is a just transition. Yeah. What we're doing as we're creating a sharing economy is we're creating two economies side by side. Well, and there's sort of the, the old economy. Um, and then there's the sharing economy where people are sort of coming together as communities and thinking about how they want to use resources and sharing those resources and creating new jobs that help us share those resources. And one key piece of the sharing economy that I think is about to explode is uh, the worker cooperative movement because worker co-ops are the platform on which people can provide livelihoods for themselves. And there are cities like uh, Jackson, Mississippi, Cleveland, Ohio, um, hopefully soon my hometown of Oakland, California, that will be uh, consciously prioritizing the growth of worker cooperatives. So creating local incentives for the creation of worker co-ops and removing barriers to the creation of worker co-ops. Because not only are these going to create jobs, but they are worker co-ops are the entity that's most guaranteed to keep jobs in a community because the workers control it. They're not going to outsource it or sell themselves out. And in a previous Good Stuff podcast, we did a fantastic interview with um, workers from the Evergreen Cooperative, which is a collection of a laundry, an urban farm, and a solar company that is all worker-owned in Cleveland and provides all those benefits that you just discussed. It's yeah. really interesting. 
What else do you see in the future of sharing? In the future of sharing, I feel like the majority of us could actually consider not owning a car, as opposed to the majority of us thinking that we need to own 2.3 cars per household. And um, it's because of car sharing. It's because of ride sharing. Hopefully, it will also be be because of better public transportation. Maybe it's also because of bike sharing. But there are all these things happening in communities that little by little make it almost possible for someone to feel good about not owning a car. Households that have two adults and one car, there will be times where both adults need a car at the same time. But if you have a relationship with your neighbors such that they're fine with lending you a car on an occasional basis, that makes it really easy. Not just a car, but a cupcake pan or a power drill or, mm -hmm. as you said, a vacuum or so yeah. many other things. A journalist recently asked me what's um, one step people could do it in their homes to reduce their energy consumption. And I said, invite your neighbor over for tea. Mm. Because if you know your neighbor, then <laughs> when you need to borrow something, you can ask your neighbor. Or when you're in the middle of baking a cake and you're two eggs short, you don't have to drive to the store. That, that getting to know our neighbors and developing that kind of culture of reciprocity is going to help so much um, as we figure out how to live on this planet with fewer resource yeah. consumption. Can you give some advice to our listeners about how to start sharing and then how to ramp it up? How do we actually become part of this sharing movement? One way that I like to suggest that people think about sharing in their lives is to break it down into three levels or three types of sharing. The first one is easy for most people, which is to begin to just share on a sort of casual, one-time basis, you know, give fruit to your neighbor, borrow a car from your neighbor, have people over for dinner, um, ask to borrow a vacuum cleaner. These are just easy things you can just start to do a lot more of. The next level, the second way that I think we really need to start sharing is to make agreements with people. Because when you make agreements, it becomes something that you can rely on. So if you make an agreement with your neighbor, let's just share this vacuum cleaner and uh, you can store it and I will borrow it from you every week or I'll send you a text message when I need to borrow it. Then you can rely on that vacuum cleaner being there for you and you don't have to just hope that magically when you ask someone to borrow it, it'll be there. Um, so agreements become something we can really rely on. And then at the third level, and this is the level that it's harder for many people because we're not all prone to organizing new organizations, but at the third level, we create organizations to share things. So it's creating a tool lending library in our neighborhood where maybe, uh, or, or a tool lending club where we have maybe 15 people who share vacuum cleaners and tools and other things. But that takes some organization. It takes a little bit of coordinating people, communicating with people, and we all have a role to play in this. Some of us are kind of idea people and we'll get it started. Other people are the types who will just help with the administrative stuff. Uh, but I think everybody should step up and help in organizing these things so that it be, doesn't become a burden on one person. It, you know, People can share the responsibilities of creating such organizations, but what these organizations do is they really give us something that we can rely on in a community. And those organizations exist when people come and go. And so the more of these organizations that exist in our communities, the more we feel like we can move to a new community and know that we can just start plugging ourselves into the existing sharing organizations. Excellent. During our conversation, Janelle and I realized we'd both come across something that demonstrated perfectly one of the greatest things about sharing. In a small California town, we had noticed a self-storage unit labeled Community Party Supplies. I actually had a chance to meet the woman who set it up, and she explained that for many years she ran a catering service and acquired hundreds of champagne flutes, place settings, tablecloths, all the things you need to throw a big party. When she retired, instead of selling her inventory, she put it all in a storage unit and posted the combination for anyone who wanted to make use of it. Sure, over the years, some of the stuff got broken or lost, but it was often replaced by other stuff. She felt really good about what she had done for the community, and she said the best part was that she got invited to some great parties. And that's what I want to leave you with. Sharing is fun. It connects you to others in the community with whom you may come to share not just stuff, but life experiences. It declutters your home. It saves you money. It reduces the use of resources and keeps your unwanted stuff from piling up in the dump or being burned in an incinerator. And it's good for the economy. What's not to like? 
Be sure to check out the links on our websites to resources for sharing, and please send us your stories of how sharing is making a difference in your life. That's it for this episode of The Good Stuff. Our show comes to you from the studios of Youth Radio in Oakland, California. Our engineer is James Rollins. The Good Stuff is produced by Bill Walker. We'll have another show online in a few weeks. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Find us on Facebook and storyofstuff.org and keep working on the good stuff in your own community. Thanks for being part of the solution.